two B.C. sawmills literally exploded back in the winter of 2012, four families were left grieving and dozens of workers were injured. But the aftershocks of those blasts ran even deeper, rocking the very foundation of one of the most important industries in Canada. As Joe Crop reports, it was a tragedy that investigators and some workers say was entirely preventable. I have never, ever seen a pile of sawdust that high. We're going to blow up. This material was dry as a bone. Burns like you wouldn't believe. You're not stupid. Everybody knows yeah, sawdust burns. Everybody knows now. Sawdust burns. And it can kill. When Bruce German and his friends get together for coffee, it's all they talk about. A dialogue of outrage and pain from survivors like Don Zwazdeski. I haven't slept in my own bed for like a week straight, like in over two years. I still sleep with the TV, TV on and the light on. I see it all the time. The mill blowing up. This is what he sees. Late April 2012, an explosion and fire at the Lakeland Sawmill in Prince George kills two workers and injures 22. Two and a half years later, these survivors return to the scene of the disaster with 16 by 9. The mill is being rebuilt, but the men, like Greg Chaco, are still broken. I have to rely on other people. Uh, that's not who I am. And um, I don't like who I am. The men are traumatized and bitter. The mill owners, they say, should have known that dust is a killer. Because it had killed before, just three months earlier, in fact. In January of that year, only two hours drive down the highway, the Babine sawmill in Burns Lake had blown up in identical circumstances. Ryan Clay survived, and he also agreed to return with us to the scene of that first explosion. And here we are. tough to hold it together right now. Just about died right over there. Now they're up and running like nothing's happened. This is what almost killed him. Again, two dead, 20 injured. Again, a lot of flammable dust. And again, like Lakeland, it's being rebuilt. You couldn't see across the mill. That's how bad the dust levels were. Even with the fans going full blast, the, the, the dust was just horrendous. In weather conditions that made work especially hazardous. It was minus 40 pretty much all week. The water lines were all froze up in the mill. Everything was so cold that they had to shut the fans down just to keep the heat in the mill. That's not very safe, if you ask me. Ryan survived burns to his face and hands. Those wounds have healed, and the Burns Lake Mill is back in operation. But Ryan's trauma is still fresh nearly three years later. Even just that smell, the smell of sawdust brings back so many memories. It's something the survivors of the two explosions have in common. They remember and relive the smallest details. That day was uh, basically like any other day. I did my normal prayer, thanking God for my job, to, ever, to be able to provide for my family. It was such a nice night out. And uh, everything was calm. It was like the calm before the storm. It was a relatively smooth running day. Wood was going. We were running probably 60% spruce that day, if not more. And then I heard this odd wind. I've never heard this sound before. 
there was a huge bang, like two steel doors clanging together, and the whole mill shook. Uh, I turned to my left to see what was going on. And I was looking up, and I could see the, all the dust that was collected on the beams and the ceiling. You could see that layer slowly coming down. And at that point, I, I, I could see the fireball coming at me slow motion from the edgers. The fire was dark red and black, and it was churning. And the last image I had was my arm shielding the fire from my eyes. Um, at that time, I had shoulder-length hair. It was quite long. Uh, and I remember I could feel my hair blowing in the wind and just disappearing. And I could see embers slowly waffling down like paper ashes. And, and I could see flames still. And I started rolling, thinking it was me that was on fire. I started to feel my face. It felt like it was dripping. I thought it was done. I, I literally thought, I just got to sit somewhere where they're going to find my body. I did not want to survive the fire if I had no face. Uh, I, to me, death was better than surviving without a face. Oh, my God, my face ain't even there. I couldn't feel it. I was like, oh, my God. Somehow, the two men found their way out of the inferno. Bruce had serious burns to his face and body. The only parts of Greg's body that weren't burned were his feet. Outside the mill, Greg ran into a group of injured workers, including Glenn Roche. Standing on the road waiting for help. Some people had no clothes on. Uh, others were drenched in water to cool themselves off. Uh, they were shaking. Uh, Glenn was uh, asking for help saying he was, he's dying, I need help, I'm dying. Uh, and I was just trying to tell him to hang on. It was hard to look at him and talk to him because he had no face. All he had was two eye holes and a little hole where his mouth was. And I knew he wasn't going to make it, but I told him that he'd be OK. Glenn Roche would die the next day in an Edmonton hospital. I see Glenn every day of my life, especially when I go to sleep at night. I only wish that people listened to us when we try to prevent it. I really wish someone had Next, you have said off camera, people have blood on their hands. Yes. Nothing of this magnitude had ever happened before. The sawmill explosions in Prince George and Burns Lake, BC in 2012 shook the Canadian lumber industry to its core. Workers and union officials blame a relentless drive for profits. The continuing push to get production out the door. Stephen Hunt is the director of the United Steelworkers, the union that represents the sawmill workers. He says the explosions were a failure of regulation in an industry going through hard times. The mills were running on the edge to put any more regulatory barriers up or red tape, I think is problematic. When you say mills were running on the edge, was that common knowledge throughout the industry, throughout government? Oh, sure it was. Survivors say the sawmills were operating recklessly. Nobody ever listened. When you tell them anything, it was like, no, it's our way or the highway. The story really begins with a bug, the mountain pine beetle an insect that, since 2005, has been killing vast amounts of lumber in BC. The trees are dying, but they still have commercial value. So forestry companies have been buying them cheaply and processing the wood as fast as possible. There was a real effort to try to get the stuff out the door, there's no question. 
The problem is the dust the wood produces. It's very dry, and when it accumulates in the air, it can ignite. And those fires can, potentially, turn a sawmill into a giant bomb. Neil McManus has been studying workplace safety and writing about it all his life. The irony that, that comes out of this is that there have been fires, many fires involving sawmills and the forest industry. And it seemed that all they ever got was about this much space in the newspaper. The visits by the Prince George Fire Department to the Lakeland Mill over the years got little public attention. 16 by 9 submitted a Freedom of Information request to the city of Prince George. And this is some of what we uncovered. A fire inspection in September 2010 finds a dust-filled environment. November 2011, excessive amounts of fine wood dust and a combustible hazard. A month before the explosion, the fire department noted that the mill was making an effort to reduce dust but said a fire safety plan was needed immediately. But nobody seemed to take that and put it all together and say, wait a minute, we got a problem here. Until this. In a statement earlier this year, the Lakeland owner said the dust explosion hazard was unknown to the industry and to government regulators. However, Bruce Gerben says that back in March 2012, he voiced his concerns to a mill company director we're standing there having this banter, and I'm pointing at the slasher uh, saws where it's all white as snow above them, no, no suction, no. And, I'm, and he, the last thing I get to say to him is, if we don't clean that up, we're going to blow up. And you know what he did to me as soon as I said that? Bruce, I got to go. And he, he just bolted. Like, it bothered me that when you're telling ownership, we're going to blow up, and he, as soon as you say it, he, he cuts you off and runs. The company says no such conversation ever took place. The mill blew up a month later. And it was only when there was two catastrophic explosions that everyone was forced to act. Why did that take place in that manner? Would you not think that if you were a company that owned a sawmill, that you would start to piece these things together? One would hope so. There's so many betrayals that led into all of it. All those people who are supposed to look after the employees weren't there for us. In frustration, some of the workers found their own ways to get the message across. But the union says the dust, a hazard for both breathing and for fire, never got urgent attention. Everybody in the sawmilling industry uh, understood that from time to time there would be fires uh, caused by dust. So that's an acceptable fact of life in a sawmill. There will be fires caused by dust. It became one. I, I don't know if it should be acceptable. Hunt says that's the heart of the problem. Sawmills consistently ignored a dust regulation that was very clear, but rarely enforced. Here's Health and Safety Regulation 5.81. Combustible dust must be safely removed before accumulation of the dust could cause a fire or explosion. Another guideline says a layer of dust as thin as a dime can cause an explosion if it's dispersed. 16 by 9 reviewed five years of inspection reports by WorkSafe BC at Lakeland before the explosion. Not a single violation for sawdust was issued, despite all the fires and the workers' complaints. It's as if the problem didn't exist. In the U.S., on the other hand, workplace dust has been a safety concern for years. Here's a 2009 video by the U.S. Chemical Safety Board. Dust may accumulate on surfaces and lie undisturbed for years. Then some initial fire or explosion, known as a primary event, shakes it loose and ignites it. According to subsequent investigations by a government agency, that's exactly what happened at Lakeland three years later. And at Burns Lake, which is owned by an American company, Hampton Affiliates. Between 1980 and 2005, there were 281 dust fires and explosions in the U.S. Nearly a quarter involved wood materials. In fact, the U.S. Bureau of Mines issued a report 52 years ago that referred to the explosibility of wood dust. 
Despite all that history, the owners of the BC mills say they just didn't know. The owners say they were not negligent because exploding wood dust is a new unforeseen risk. And yet you've told me in North America, technically we've known about wood dust explosions since 1962. So how do these companies get away with saying that? Well, I don't know. I don't know how they possibly can. The sawmill tragedies were allowed to happen. You have said off camera, people have blood on their hands. Yes, the events, they weren't accidents. I would suggest were allowed to happen because people did not take the actions needed, didn't have the knowledge they needed to take the action. If not by the sawmill owners, he says, action should have been taken by government inspectors. But in an extraordinary lapse, those inspectors compromised not one, but two investigations. Next, a deadly accident without accountability. Our society just accepts that people die for a living. Thirty minutes before this sawmill in Burns Lake, BC exploded in 2012, a worker in the mill got on his cell phone. His name was Robert Lugie and he was reaching out to his wife, Maureen. He sent me a text and said, um, please pray for me, I'm going to check something out. And so I said, okay, because we always prayed for each other. It's believed Lugie had spotted a small fire in the mill, but Maureen would never know for sure. And so never heard from him again. That was 28. I understand that the explosion took place at 10 after 8. He was pretty much cremated out there. There wasn't much of his remains that were available, but um, they, they did what they could to, for us to be able to have a proper burial for him. Rhonda Roche is another widow from one of two explosions. Her husband, Glenn, died in the blast that destroyed the Lakeland Mill in Prince George three months after Burns Lake. Well, he definitely had concerns over the cleanliness of the mill, especially after Burns Lake. So that was uh, definitely one of his concerns, and he used to bug his co-workers about it quite a bit. In the aftermath of two accidents that shouldn't have happened, both widows are demanding justice. Someone's going to be held accountable. It's pretty black and white. You leave that kind of trust into the hands of investigative agencies like the RCMP and WorkSafe BC. WorkSafe BC is the government agency that's meant to ensure the safety of workers in the province. It investigated both explosions, concluded they were preventable, and urged the laying of regulatory charges against the companies. But something went terribly wrong. The investigations didn't reflect the processes and protocols necessary. That's BC Labour Minister Shirley Bond's very polite way of saying that WorkSafe messed up. It seems that as the inspectors were collecting evidence at the scene of the fires and talking to managers, they didn't follow legal procedures. So government lawyers decided they couldn't make any charges stick, so no prosecution. Their job is to look at each case individually and they made the determination that because of the way information was collected, that they could not move forward with prosecution. One of the Lakeland widows told us that it seems in the BC forest industry, the occasional death is just simply the cost of doing business. That's a pretty serious charge. You know, that's a very hard thing to hear and we're gonna work as hard as we can so that uh, families feel that their loved ones are safe and mills today are safer than they were. We still have work to do and, and we're going to continue to be aggressive about that. This is not right and everybody knows it. The people in Burns Lake know it, the people in Prince George know it, people in British Columbia know it, people right across Canada know. No one is going to shove this under the carpet and say that this is the cost of doing business because it's unacceptable for our families and that's that's, that's the bottom line for me. 
The union representing the sawmill workers says government needs to begin using the criminal code against employers who put their workers in danger. You see, every year, 1,000 Canadians are killed on the job. It's one of the worst records in the developed world. Union director Stephen Hunt. If you put one or two CEOs in jail, there'd be a paradigm shift in, in all workplaces in Canada, as we see it. A section of the criminal code called the Westray Act allows these prosecutions, but it's rarely used. You'd like the government to prosecute the sawmill owners in BC under the Westray Act? Absolutely. That's what it's there for. And it just seems that we're so conditioned to workplace death that we just take it. Our society just accepts that people die die for a living. What I'm hearing, listening to you, is that four men died, many more men injured, lives altered irrevocably. Yeah. And it's a whole lot of passing the buck. Yeah. Yeah, a tre tremendous amount. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and, uh, and dealing in uh, workplace death is awful. And, and when you... When you meet with the families, and, and see what they go through. Every politician should have a trip to that, 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 that vision because it's awful. It's truly awful. It just doesn't add up to justice and accountability. Widows Maureen Lugie and Rhonda Roche are demanding a public inquiry into the explosions that killed their husbands. It's hard looking at the pictures. There's a whole pile of people that are involved in this, and if they would all recognize their part in it, I think that would help. And survivors, like Bruce German, continue to struggle with images that just won't go away. I, I could see terror in people's eyes. It was just terror, like. I really wish we could get our lives back. A coroner's inquest into the four deaths will be held next March. Meantime, the sawmill owners have been hit with some of the biggest fines in B.C. history. A million dollars for the Burns-like explosion, which is being appealed, and more than $700,000 for the Lakeland blast. We'll be right back. Next the man who was fleeced by Russia's government. It was um, what I call the largest orgy of stealing that has ever taken place in the history of business. 